The pH scale is a measure of the acidity or alkalinity of a solution. Okay, draw one line from each solution to the pH value of the solution. So we've got acid, okay, and we've got neutral, and then we've got pH values of 5, 7, 9, 11, and 13. So what I've included here is a image of the pH scale, okay? And I've labelled that at 7, we say the pH is neutral, okay? You can see here it says pure water. So we say that at 7, it has a neutral pH. Now, for numbers which are lower than 7... We say they are acid. And numbers that are higher than 7, we say they are alkali. Okay? So, from these numbers, we're looking at which one is lower than 7. Well, that is 5. The second part of this question says, which ion in aqueous solution carries acidity? Okay, and we've got some different ions here. We've got H+, Na+, O2-, OH-. Okay, so remember that an ion is something which has a charge. Okay, so it might have gained an electron, it might have lost an electron. But either way, it has charge. Okay, now what I've shown over here in this purple pen are some examples of acids. So something like hydrochloric acid, HCl, sulfuric acid, H2SO4, and here's nitric acid, HNO3. And what I've done next to it is I've broken it down into its ions. So I've said HCl has H plus Cl minus. H2SO4 has two H pluses and an SO42 minus ion. HNO3 has a H plus and an NO3 minus. So hopefully you are able to spot that all these acids have H plus ions in. Okay, so the answer is H plus. The next part says, when sulfuric acid is added to sodium hydroxide, a reaction occurs to produce two products. The equation is H2SO4 plus 2NaOH makes Na2SO4 plus 2H2O. Okay, so hopefully we can put things together. The sodium hydroxide is the NaOH, okay, and sulfuric acid is H2SO4. Now the question asks, how many elements are there in the formula H2SO4? So remember, elements are made up of one type of atom. So basically, this question is asking us how many types of atom are there in H2SO4? So hopefully you can see that we've got hydrogen, sulfur, oxygen, okay? So that's three types of atom. So the answer is three. A common mistake that might be made here would be adding up the amount of atoms. So a lot of people might have put seven. So this is why it's really important to read the question carefully because it asks how many elements there are. Now we need to name the type of reaction. So I've just put in the equation from above here. So what we've got is we've got sulfuric acid. Okay, so it's an acid. Plus 2NaOH, which is an alkali. I'll talk about how I know that in a minute. Makes Na2SO4, which is a salt, plus 2H2O which is water. So acid plus alkali 
make salt and water. Now, the reason I know that H2SO4 is an acid is because it has H plus ions in it. And the reason I know that NaOH is an alkali is because it has OH minus ions in it. So, what is this type of reaction? Well, I've got an acid, I've got an alkali, and I'm making water, which is something with a neutral pH. Therefore, it is a neutralisation reaction for one mark. And the next question asks us to name the salt produced. Okay, so the salt is this one here, Na2SO4. So Na is sodium, so we're thinking it might have something to do with sodium. And hopefully you are aware that the SO4 2 minus ion is a sulfate. OK, so if, if you put two and two together, name the salt, it is sodium sulfate. The final part of this question asks us to describe how an indicator can be used to show when all the sodium hydroxide has reacted with sulfuric acid. So if we remember from the last part, we said that an acid plus an alkali makes salt and water. OK, now if we think about that from an ion perspective, that's like saying a H plus plus an OH minus makes H2O. Remember, H2O is water, which has a neutral pH. So this is a neutralisation reaction. So. The answer to this question is, first of all, we need to add a universal indicator to the sodium hydroxide. The next thing that we need to do is we need to add sulfuric acid gradually. And then the final part of this question is looking for a colour change. And that colour change is to green. So we're waiting for the universal indicator to turn green. And that's telling us that there is a pH of 7. And remember, when it's green is when there is a neutral pH. OK, so that is the H2O. Now, an alternate answer that you could have put is to say it the other way around. So you could have said, add the indicator to the sulfuric acid and then add the sodium hydroxide gradually. And then obviously the colour change will still be the same. OK, so that was a three mark question. So hopefully you're able to see in the way that I've set out my answer, I've broken it clearly into three points so the examiner can clearly mark it. John Newlands arranged the known elements into a table in order of atomic weight. Figure 1 shows part of Newland's table. So what we can see in figure 1 is the group numbers. We've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And then underneath these group numbers, we have the elements. OK, so in group 1, Newland's put hydrogen, fluorine and chlorine. The first part of this question asks, what are the names of the elements in group 5 of Newland's table? So when we look at group 5 of Newland's table, we are looking at this section here. OK, we're looking at the elements under the group 5. So we've got C and SI. Now, using our modern periodic table, which we're given a copy of in the exam, we are able to work out that C stands for carbon and SI stands for silicon. Therefore, the correct answer for one mark is carbon and silicon. The next question asks, in what order is the modern periodic table arranged? So we're no longer talking about John Newland's table. 
we're now talking about the periodic table which you have a copy of in your exam. And I've shown a copy of that on the right hand side of the screen. So, in what order is this periodic table arranged? Well, hopefully you can see that the bottom number increases. So, for lithium it's 3, for beryllium it's 4, boron it's 5, carbon it's 6, etc, etc. Now, this small number is the atomic number. Okay? And the atomic number tells you the number of protons that are in the atom. So, in what order is the modern periodic table arranged? It is arranged in order of atomic number. And that's your answer for one mark. The next part of this question said give two differences between group one of Newland's table and group one of the periodic table. So, what I've shown is Newland's table on the left, and I've highlighted group one. And then the modern periodic table on the right. Okay, and I've highlighted group one in yellow. So hopefully we are able to see that neither hydrogen, fluorine or chlorine are in group one on the modern periodic table. And saying that would be enough for one mark. For the second mark, you needed to say that lithium, sodium or potassium are in group one on the periodic table, whereas the not on Newland's table. An alternative point that you could have put was rather than saying hydrogen, fluorine and chlorine are not in group one, you could have said they are not in the same group. In 1864, atoms were thought to be particles that could not be divided up into smaller particles. By 1898, the electron had been discovered and the plum pudding model of an atom was proposed. Figure 2 shows the plum pudding model of an atom of carbon and the nuclear model of an atom of carbon. So let's just take a second to realise what's going on here. So the plum pudding model shows a ball of positive charge, okay, with electrons embedded in it. The nuclear model shows a nucleus which has these particles in it, okay, so they're protons with a positive charge and neutrons with a neutral charge and then orbiting around the positively charged nucleus are these things called electrons, okay? And they whiz around the nucleus in shells. So, this question says, compare. Okay, so compare is already our command word. So, we're thinking about similarities and differences, okay? That's what a compare question means. So, let's carry on reading the question. So, compare the position of the subatomic particles. So, subatomic particles are protons, neutrons and electrons. Okay, so when we're answering this question, we want to be thinking about those sorts of things in the plum pudding model with the nuclear model. So, it's a comparison question. So, first of all, Let's start by thinking about charge. Well, the plum pudding model is a ball of positive charge. OK, whereas the nuclear model has its its positive charge concentrated inside the nucleus. And that's because of the protons which are inside the nucleus in the nuclear model. So, notice in my answer here, I'm setting it out like a comparison. So, the plum pudding model is a sphere of positive charge, whereas the nuclear model has a positive nucleus. Now, if we carry on thinking about that nucleus, 
hopefully we can realise that the plum pudding model doesn't actually have a nucleus. Whereas the nuclear model does have a nucleus, which is obviously where we find our protons and our neutrons. A third point that we could make is to think more about those neutrons. So the plum pudding model doesn't have anything to do with neutrons. OK, there's no mention of neutrons at all. So we can say the plum pudding model has no neutrons, but the nuclear model does have neutrons, which we can find in the nucleus along with the protons. Now, the final point that we need to make, because remember, this is a four mark question. So we want to make four points is about the electrons. So in the plum pudding model, the electrons are in random positions. OK, whereas in the nuclear model, the electrons are in shells. OK, they're in fixed shells which orbit round the nucleus. OK, so we can compare um, the electrons. So this was a four mark question, as I said. So it's really important that in our answer, we show that we've made four clear points. So point one is about charge. Point two is about the nucleus. Point three about the neutrons and point four about the electrons. So the next question says, Models are used to show the differences between elements, compounds and mixtures. Which circle shows a model of a mixture? Tick one box for one mark. So the first thing to think about with this question is what is a mixture? So a mixture is when we've got different things. OK, so they could be elements, they could be compounds and they are together but they are not chemically bonded. OK, and that's the difference between a compound and a mixture. So in a compound, they are chemically bonded, but in a mixture, they are not. So hopefully we can see the top one here. Argon is an element. OK, it's made of one type of atom. These bottom two are compounds. OK, we've got N2, nitrogen gas, and we've got CO2, carbon dioxide. So therefore, the second one must be a mixture. OK, this is because the argon, the nitrogen gas, the oxygen gas and the carbon dioxide are not chemically bonded together. Figure three shows a molecule of carbon dioxide. What does each line between the atoms in figure three represent? Tick one box for one mark. So let's look at our options. So we've got covalent bond, intermolecular force, ionic bond and metallic bond. So let's break these down one by one and think about what each of these terms mean. So a covalent bond is a bond between a non-metal and another non-metal. OK, and it involves the sharing of electrons. An intermolecular force describes a force between the molecule. OK, between the molecule. An ionic bond is between a non-metal and a metal. OK, and it's down to the attraction between the non-metal ion and the metal ion. And then a metallic bond occurs in metals and it's all to do with the electrostatic attraction between the lattice of positive ions and the C of D localised electrons. So hopefully we can see in figure three, we've got carbon atoms and oxygen atoms. Carbon is a non-metal. O for oxygen is also a non-metal. 
Therefore, what is the type of bonding between two nonmetals? Well, that is a covalent bond. Some students investigated the reactivity of four unknown metals, W, X, Y and Z. The letters are not the symbols of these elements. The students used metal salt solutions of copper nitrate, magnesium sulfate and zinc chloride. This is the method used. Pour a solution of metal salt into a glass beaker. Okay, so that might be the copper nitrate, magnesium sulfate or zinc chloride. Measure the temperature of the solution. Then add one gram of metal to the solution measure the temperature again, and then calculate the temperature increase. The students did the experiment using each salt solution with each metal. Figure four shows the apparatus the student used. So we can see that we've got a thermometer, which is obviously to measure the temperature. Okay, we have the one gram of metal on a spatula, the glass beaker, and then metal salt solution of the same concentration. Okay, so having the same concentration is a control variable of this experiment. Table one shows the students' results. So what we have here is we have the solutions down the left hand side, so copper nitrate, magnesium sulfate, zinc chloride. And then here we have the temperature increase measured in degrees Celsius. So we have for metal W, for metal X, for metal Y, and for metal Z. The first question says, which metal is least reactive? Tick one box for one mark. So, metal W had 46 degrees Celsius with copper nitrate, no change with magnesium sulfate, and 15 degrees Celsius with zinc chloride. So if we compare all these different metals, hopefully you were able to instantly see that metal Z had no temperature change with either solution. Therefore, metal Z is the least reactive for one mark. So the reason for this is that metal Z does not react with any of the three solutions. Metal Z is not reactive enough to displace copper, magnesium or zinc in the compounds. OK, it cannot displace because it is not more reactive than copper, magnesium or zinc. This next question asks, how do the results show that magnesium is more reactive than the metals W, X, Y and Z? So for this question, we need to be looking at the reactions with the magnesium sulfate solution. So hopefully we can see from what I've highlighted that there is no temperature change when magnesium sulfate reacts with any of the metals. So for our answer, we could write magnesium sulfate does not react with any of the metals. Therefore, it is more reactive. An alternate point you could have put for the mark is to say that there is no change or there is no increase in temperature with any of the metals. Either of those are fine for the one mark. The next question asks, how do the results show that the reaction between metal Y and copper nitrate solution is exothermic? So let's find what this is referring to on table one. So the reaction between metal Y and copper nitrate solution is referring to this 29 degrees temperature increase. So the answer to this question was simply to say, well, there is a temperature increase or a temperature rise. Therefore, the reaction is going to be exothermic 
because remember that exothermic reactions are reactions which give off heat. Okay, so that is why it is an exothermic reaction. One student said that the investigation was not valid, i.e. not a fair test. For this formal question, we need to write a plan for the investigation that includes improvements to the method and apparatus. Okay, so we need to think about how can we improve the method, possibly how could we improve the equipment that we use to make this experiment better and make it a fair test. So at the bottom of the screen, I've just put in what we saw earlier in the question, which was the method that the student used. So remember it said, pour a solution of a metal salt into a glass beaker, measure the temperature, add one gram of metal to the solution, measure the temperature of the solution, and then calculate the temperature increase. So let's go through this method that we've already been given and think about some ways that we could improve it. So let's start with the first step. Pour a solution of metal salt into a glass beaker. Okay, so straight away I'm thinking pour a solution. That's quite vague. How much, what quantity, what amount of the solution are we pouring in? And why a glass beaker? A glass beaker isn't very insulated, so perhaps we can think of something better that's more insulated to pour the salt solution into. Then, measure the temperature of the solution. Okay, I think that's fine. The next thing says, add one gram of metal to the solution. Right, that's quite good because we've got an, an amount there. But then it says, measure the temperature of the solution. Well, after how long do we do that? After what amount of time? And also, how do we make sure that all of the solution has reacted? That's another thing to bear in mind. Step five says, calculate the temperature increase. That's fine. But what about repeating the experiment? What about calculating a mean? These are all things that would make the experiment more of a fair test. So when we're also thinking about a fair test, we also want to think about control variables, okay, which we mentioned earlier in the question. So some control variables of this experiment could be things like using the same amount of metal salt solution or using the same concentration of metal salt solution. Okay, so there's some ideas, because remember, this is a four mark question. So in an exam, you would want to take your time, think about planning the question, planning your answer before you actually start writing. So let's think about writing an answer to this question. So the first thing I would write is pour a fixed volume of the metal salt solution into a polystyrene cup. So I've added that we need a fixed volume and rather than a beaker, we're using a polystyrene cup. The next thing I'm gonna talk about is our control variables. So for each experiment, ensure that the same amount and the same concentration of solution is used. The next thing I'm gonna mention is the same as earlier in the question just measure the temperature of the solution. And again, as before, add one gram of metal to the solution. Now, the next bit I'm going to add is to stir the solution. And this is important to make sure it all reacts. Next, measure the temperature of the solution, as it said before, but now I've added after a set time. So that's an improvement I've made. Then, calculate the temperature increase. And the final thing I'm gonna add is to repeat the experiment and calculate a mean. 
Okay, so it was a four mark question. Quite involved, that one. The next question says, figure five shows the reaction profile of an exothermic reaction. So let's look at what we've got going on in figure five. So we've got energy on the y-axis and progressive reaction on the x-axis. And we're looking at the energy change when we go from reactants to products. Okay, we've got this funny looking hill thing going on here, which is 100 uh, sorry, 1,370 kilojoules. And then we've got this smaller arrow here showing the overall energy change. So this question says, what does the energy value of 1,370 kilojoules represent? Well, this represents something called the activation energy. And the activation energy is the minimum energy needed for a reaction to occur. OK, so when a reaction happens, the particles collide and the activation energy is the minimum energy that those particles need in order for a reaction to occur. And it's represented by this sort of bell shape on the graph. OK. The final part of this question says the overall energy change is 386 kilojoules. What percentage of 1,370 kilojoules is this? Give your answer to two significant figures. So, to answer this maths question, we need to work out what proportion of 1,370 is 386. So, to do this, we need to do 386 divided by 1,370. Now, the question asks what percentage. So because we want our answer as a percentage, we need to times that proportion by 100, which when you type that in your calculator, gets you 28.175. Now, going back to the question, remember, we want our answer to two significant figures. Therefore, the final answer would be 28%. So this was a two mark question, one mark awarded for the correct working out, second mark awarded for the final answer, rounded to two significant figures. The three states of matter are solid, liquid, and gas. Lithium reacts with water to produce lithium hydroxide solution and hydrogen. Use the correct state symbols from the box to complete the chemical equation. So our options are, we've got AQ, which stands for aqueous, which means it's dissolved in water. We've got G, which stands for gas, okay, so it's in a gaseous state. We've got L, which stands for liquid, and S for solid. So if we look at the equation, we've got lithium, solid, plus water, which is a liquid, makes lithium hydroxide, we need to figure out the state of that, plus hydrogen. Again, we need to figure out the state of that. So, the easiest one to figure out is the hydrogen. Now, hydrogen will be emitted as a gas, okay? And we can test for hydrogen gas using a squiggy pop test. Now, the lithium hydroxide will be aqueous. And the reason for this is it is dissolved in water. OK, so the lithium hydroxide for one mark is aqueous. And then the hydrogen for one mark is a gas. Figure six shows the melting point and the boiling points of four substances, A, B, C, and D. So let's take a look at figure six. So we've got substance A, B, C, D, and we can see that we have the melting points are denoted by a cross, and then we have the boiling points are denoted by a circle, okay? And the melting and the boiling points are plotted for each substance A, B, C, and D. 
and we can read off and find out what that melting point and that boiling point is from the y-axis which tells us the temperature in degrees celsius so for example i could find out the boiling point of substance a by going to the solid dot and reading off and saying it has a, a boiling point of zero degrees Celsius. This question asks, which substance is a liquid over the greatest temperature range? So for this question, we need to look back at figure six, which I've included on the right hand side of the screen here. So what we're looking at is when something is a liquid, okay, it has melted from a solid and it can boil to become a gas. So essentially we're looking at the difference between its melting point and its boiling point. So with relation to figure six, we're looking at the length of these solid lines, okay? The length of essentially the difference between the melting and the boiling points. Now we want the greatest temperature range so we want the biggest difference between the melting and boiling points. And hopefully you're able to see that the answer to this question will be C. Okay, because this here is the longest line. It has the greatest temperature range. This next question asks, which two substances are gases at 50 degrees Celsius? We need to tick one box for one mark. So this is referring back to figure six. So on figure six, the first thing I would do is draw a line like this at 50 degrees Celsius. Okay, now we're thinking about which substances are gases. Okay, now remember something is a gas once it's reached its boiling point. So the boiling points are the solid dots. So we're looking at this, 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 and this. Now, hopefully we can appreciate that the boiling point of substance A and substance D has already been reached at 50 degrees Celsius, okay? Because the boiling point for A is at zero and the boiling point for D is at around minus 160. So at 50 degrees Celsius, we've already reached that boiling point. Therefore, the answer is A and D, because at 50 degrees Celsius, they will be in their gaseous state. The next question says, a different substance, E, has a melting point of minus 50 and a boiling point of positive 120. We need to plot these two values on figure six. So I've just shown figure six underneath. So let's start with a melting point of minus 50. Now remember a melting point we use a cross for. So I need to put a cross for E at minus 50. Okay, so it should look like that. Now let's look at the boiling point. So it says a boiling point of positive 120 degrees Celsius. And for boiling point, we use this colored in dot. So for E, I need to find 120. So here's 100, here's 150. So each one of these lines is 10, isn't it? So we go 100, 110, 120. OK, and that is good enough for the two marks. So you get one mark for the correct boiling point and one mark for the correct melting point. There's no need to put the line between them. So may as well not do that. The next part of the question says, figure seven shows the apparatus a student used to determine the melting point and the boiling point of substance B in figure six. 
So let's just spend a minute breaking down what we can see in figure seven. So we can see a thermometer, which obviously we use to measure temperature. We can see we've got substance B inside a test tube or possibly a boiling tube. And then we've got water in a beaker. And this is all on top of a tripod with a Bunsen burner underneath. OK, that provides the heat. So this question says, explain, command word there, explain why the student could not use this apparatus to determine the boiling point of substance B. OK, so I've included figure six underneath because we're going to have to make reference to this because we're talking about the boiling point of substance B. So let's find that on the graph. So we've got substance B. Boiling point is this coloured in dot. So the bit that we're looking at is this here. And if you read that off the graph, you should be able to see that the boiling point of substance B is 190 degrees Celsius. And actually, that is worth one mark. So you can say the boiling point of substance B is 190 degrees Celsius. Perfect for one mark. Now for the second part uh, mark of this question, we need to link that back to the apparatus. So if I just go back to figure seven, hopefully we can see the mentioning of water. Now water has a boiling point of 100 degrees Celsius. Okay, water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. And that is what you needed to put for your second mark. So the boiling point of water is 100 degrees Celsius. So what this means is that since the boiling point of water is 100 degrees Celsius, the apparatus can't safely raise the temperature of B beyond 100 degrees Celsius. OK, so that is why the student could not use the apparatus to determine the boiling point of B. OK, so this was two mark question and it was an explain question. Now, explain questions tend to be more involved because we have to connect together the data from figure six. We have to be able to read it. But then we also have to be able to draw a link and draw a connection to figure seven and realise that mention of water, OK, which has a boiling point of 100 degrees Celsius. The final part of this question says suggest being the command word, one reason why the student could not use the apparatus to determine the exact melting point of substance B. OK, so this is a suggest question. So that means that there are multiple right answers on the mark scheme and it's covering something that maybe you haven't been explicitly taught at school. So the first answer that's on the mark scheme is that there is too much of substance B to melt instantly, i.e. it would melt at different times. OK. Two of the alternate points that were on the mark scheme was it said allow answers based on thermal conductivity. So maybe the substance's ability to conduct heat varied. Or you could have mentioned something about the temperature gradient between the wall of the test tube and the thermometer. OK, you can actually see in figure seven that they do make direct contact. So you only needed to mention one point for one mark. This question is about making copper salts. Figure eight shows the apparatus given to a student. So let's just take a minute to think about this apparatus and what the student might use it for. So the first thing we've got is a stirring rod. So obviously with a stirring rod, uh, the student's going to be mixing things together. OK, we've got a spatula. So we're thinking about maybe a transfer of a powder. 
Okay, we've got a beaker. That's pretty normal, isn't it, to mix things together. Now we've got a filter funnel and paper. So maybe we're going to be using filtration. And then we've also got an evaporating basin. So possibly we're going to be evaporating something. We've got a Bunsen burner. So we're thinking about giving something heat. Then obviously we've got the tripod that goes on the mat. So that sits above the Bunsen burner and then a conical flask. So what we've done here is we've broken down the information that the exam board has given us to help put together a plan for an answer before we've even read the actual question. So this question is asking us to outline a safe plan. Okay, so we need to think about safety protocol in our answer that the student could use to make pure dry crystals of the soluble salt, copper sulfate, Okay, so that means that the copper sulfate is able to dissolve from the insoluble metal oxide, so metal oxide that can't dissolve, and a dilute acid. Okay then, so the first step in the method is to add an excess of copper oxide, which is our insoluble metal oxide, to sulfuric acid, which is our dilute acid, and we're going to add them together into a beaker. Now, the reason we're going to add an excess of copper oxide is to make sure that all of it reacts with the sulfuric acid. OK, the second step is to stir the copper oxide and sulfuric acid together. And we're going to use a stirring rod, which was in our equipment list that we just discussed. Step three now is to heat the mixture. And how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to place it over the Bunsen burner. Step four is now the filtration, which we've previously discussed. So we need to filter the mixture using our filter funnel and our filter paper. And we're going to filter it into an evaporating basin. OK, now the reason we're going to use filtration is to remove that excess of copper oxide which we added in step one. OK. Step five now is an evaporation. So we need to evaporate off the remaining water in the filtrate. Now, the filtrate is the liquid which we have passed through the filter. OK, so it's basically what we're left with having filtrated. OK. And the reason that we're evaporating off this, this uh, water that's left in the filtrate is to make sure that we get pure crystals. OK. Step six now is to leave the filtrate in a warm place. And this is to allow it to dry and therefore crystallize, which means to form crystals. OK. Step seven then is finally to remove and just dry the crystals. So you could use something like uh, a paper towel just to gently dab down those crystals to remove any um, excess water or residue that's on them. OK, now what we haven't discussed yet is the safety procedures. So some examples of these could include wearing safety goggles. OK, because we're dealing with potentially dangerous chemicals like copper oxide and sulfuric acid. And then the other one is to make sure to not touch the hot beaker. OK, it has been heated over a Bunsen burner, so it's going to be hot. So when filtering, we could use something like tongs. OK. So this question was quite difficult and it was worth six marks. Now, the way this question would have been marked was using a level based system. OK, so it's not sort of one mark for each correct point that's made, but rather a more um, all round approach to the marking. So what the examiners are looking for is they're looking for your method to be logically ordered. And you can see that I've numbered my steps 
and I've put all my different steps in a very clear order. So it's very clear for the examiner to be able to mark. Um, another thing that the examiners are looking for is mention of scientific techniques and scientific methods. So we've used scientific terms like adding an excess. Okay, we've spoken about things like filtration and evaporation, right? A filtrate and then talking about crystallization. So these are the sort of key terms that an examiner is looking for. We've also mentioned the safety precautions about the safety goggles and about using tongs because of the hot beaker. And they're really important things that an examiner is looking for in your answer as well. We've made reference to the equipment list that we were given. So we've mentioned the beaker, the stirring rod, the Bunsen burner, the filter funnel and the paper. OK, we've spoken about a water bath. OK, and then we've also made sure that our method would be able to produce valid results. So if you went in the lab and you followed these seven instructions, you would end up with pure dry crystals of the soluble salt, copper sulphate. Figure 9 shows an apparatus to produce elements from a solution of an ionic compound. So let's have a look at figure 9. So what we've got here is we've got a DC power supply. Okay, so a direct current of electricity. Then we've got two electrodes, okay, they are inert, which means they are unreactive. So we have the cathode here, which has a negative charge, and we have the anode here, which has a positive charge. And then here we have the copper sulfate solution. Okay, the first question says, what is the name of the process in figure nine? So we need to tick one box here for one mark. So the options are combustion, crystallization, distillation and electrolysis. Now, the correct answer for this question would have been electrolysis. And the reason for this is electrolysis is a process where we split up a compound using electricity. OK, and that's exactly what figure nine is showing. We've got this copper sulfate compound and we're going to use um, electricity to split that up into its elements. OK, so the correct answer was electrolysis for one mark. Table two shows the products formed from three experiments using different compounds and the apparatus shown in figure nine. So let's just take a bit of time to look at table two. So in table two, we've got three compounds. We've got a copper chloride, um, another copper chloride and potassium bromide. But notice that the difference between these two copper chlorides is their state. OK, so copper chloride is molten, whereas this copper chloride here is in an aqueous solution. So what we're being told is the product at the cathode which remember the cathode has a negative charge, so it will attract the positively charged ions in the solution, okay? And then the product at the anode, so remember the anode has a positive charge, therefore it will attract negative ions, okay? Right, so let's look at this question. So the question says to use table two, to name the products formed at each electrode if using an aqueous solution of potassium bromide. So some of you might be asking, well, what's the difference between this potassium bromide here, which is molten, versus the aqueous solution of potassium bromide? Well, if it's an aqueous solution, that means it's dissolved in water. And in water, remember, there are H plus ions and OH minus ions because water is H2O. OK, so in our solution, we've got H plus ions, we've got OH minus ions, but then we've also got the potassium ions. 
which are positively charged, and the bromide ions, which are negatively charged. Okay, so we need to think what is going to be produced at the cathode, which remember has a negative charge, and at the anode, okay, which has a positive charge. So let's start by thinking about the cathode. So the cathode is negatively charged, therefore it will attract positively charged species. So our choice is hydrogen or potassium. Now, the rule of what is formed at the cathode is this. The metal will be produced if it is less reactive than hydrogen. Okay, and we can use the reactivity series to look at that. But hydrogen will be produced if the metal is more reactive than hydrogen. So, potassium is more reactive than hydrogen because potassium is in group one of the periodic table. Okay, it's an alkaline metal, which is very reactive. So therefore, using that rule, hydrogen will be formed at the cathode. Now, the anode is positively charged. Okay, therefore, it will attract negatively charged species. So our option now is the OH minus or the Br minus, okay? Now the rule at the anode is that if the negative ion is simple, i.e. contains only one atom, like Cl minus or Br minus as we've got here, then that element will be produced. Okay, so we can see that we've got a complex ion, OH minus, and a simple ion, Br minus, Therefore, bromine will be produced at the anode. So the last part of this question says, explain why copper is formed at the cathode during the electrolysis of its salts. Okay, so let's break this question down. So it's an explain question. So we need to connect together different parts of, of chemistry to understand this question. It's talking about copper. Now, copper is a transition metal and as an ion, OK, it's a positive ion because it's a metal. OK, so that could be your first point. So you could say that copper forms positive ions. OK, so now what we need to do is we need to connect that to the cathode. So hopefully we remember that the cathode is negatively charged. Therefore, the, the copper ions will be attracted to the cathode. Okay, because positive and negative charge are attracted. So I've written here, the cathode is negatively charged Therefore, the copper ions will be attracted to it. OK, and that's enough for the two marks. So the marks are rewarded one mark for saying that copper forms positive ions. And then the second mark is coming from talking about the attraction OK, between the negative cathode and the positive copper ions. This question is about calcium. What type of compound is calcium oxide? Tick one box for one mark. So let's read through our options. So our options are an acid, a base, a carbonate or a salt. So, let's think about calcium oxide. Okay, so calcium oxide is made up of calcium 2 plus ions and O2 minus ions. Okay, therefore, it has the formula CaO. Now, if the calcium oxide, the CaO, reacts with water, 
an interesting thing happens. Because this is formed here. And this is called calcium hydroxide. Now notice the OH. Okay, it's got an OH minus ions in it. It's got OH minus ions in it, which therefore makes it a base. So the answer to this question is that calcium oxide is a base. And that's because when it reacts with water, it makes calcium hydroxide, which contains OH minus ions. Hence, it's a base. Ionic compounds, such as calcium oxide, have high melting points. Complete the sentences using words from the box. So let's look at what our options are in the box. So we've got bonds, forces, ions and layers. So let's think about what each of these terms mean. Well, bonds. Hopefully we know that there's three types of bond. OK, there's an ionic bond. There is a covalent bond and a metallic bond. OK, and a bond is something that holds together the different atoms in a compound. OK, now the next one says forces. So a force is a push or a pull. OK, a force is an interaction between two different things. Now, ions, so remember, ions are charged particles and they can either have a positive charge or they can have a negative charge, depending on whether they've gained or lost electrons. And then layers. So layers are what occur in a lattice structure. OK, so let's read the, the sentences. So it says the calcium oxide has a giant ionic lattice. OK, so it's made up of layers of ions in which there are strong electrostatic some things of attraction in all direction. Now, the correct answer here was forces of attraction. OK, because, yes, it's an ionic bond between the, the calcium positive metal ions and the, the oxygen um, negative non-metal ions. But an ionic bond is that electrostatic force of attraction. Positive ion, negative ion, they feel that pull together. And that pull that draws opposite charges together is the electrostatic force of attraction. Figure 10 shows the electronic structure of an oxygen atom and a calcium atom. So let's look at the oxygen atom on the left. So in oxygen's outer shell is six electrons. Therefore, we can say oxygen is in group six. In calcium's outer shell is two electrons. So we can say that calcium is in group two. So the question asks to describe how the calcium atom and the oxygen atom forms calcium oxide. And we need to think about the charge of each ion formed. So what I've just drawn here is the oxygen ion that will be formed. And essentially, oxygen wants to have a full outer shell. And in its outer shell, it wants six, uh, it wants eight electrons. It's got six electrons at the minute. So the oxygen gains two electrons, as you can see in the diagram. So this gives it a two minus charge, OK, because there are two more electrons than protons. OK. Now, in calcium, remember, calcium is in group two. So it's got two electrons in its outer shell, but really it wants to have eight. So the easiest way for it to get from two in the outer shell to eight is to lose those two electrons. OK. As you can see, I've scribbled out in red on the original calcium atom. So this gives calcium a two plus charge because it has two more protons than electrons. 
okay? And it has lost two electrons. Now, you might be thinking, where do those two lost electrons go? And where does oxygen gain its two electrons from? Well, this is because of the transfer of electrons, okay? Those two electrons that calcium has lost has been transferred to the oxygen, hence forming an ionic bond. So how would you write this in your answer? Well, you might write something like this. You might say the two electrons are transferred from the calcium to the oxygen. Then you might want to talk about the calcium atom. So this means that calcium has lost two electrons, therefore forming a two plus charge for reasons that we discussed before. This makes sense as well because calcium is a metal and metals form positive ions. Now oxygen gains two electrons, therefore has a two minus charge. Okay, so this was a four mark question and you got marks for the following things. Okay, the first mark was awarded for saying that Two electrons are transferred. So talking about the transfer of electrons. Now, the second mark was for realising that calcium is going to lose electrons and oxygen is going to gain electrons. And then third mark is for saying that calcium gets a two plus charge and for realising that um, an oxide ion will be formed, which is going to have a two minus charge. Figure 12 shows a reactor used to produce titanium from titanium chloride. So let's have a look at figure 12. So what we can see here is an atmosphere of dry argon gas. And then here is the mixture of sodium and titanium chloride. The chemical equation for the reaction of titanium chloride with sodium is this. So we've got titanium chloride, which is TiCl4, plus sodium, which is Na, and we're going to have four moles of sodium. And that's going to make titanium Ti plus sodium chloride, NaCl. Okay, and there's going to be four moles of that. So these fours, the four on the sodium and the four on the sodium chloride, are there to make sure that the equation is balanced. For one reaction, 1,615 kilograms of titanium chloride reacted completely with 782 kilograms of sodium, and then 1,989 kilograms of sodium chloride was produced. And this, the first question asks us to calculate the mass of titanium that was produced from the reaction. So we've got 1,615 kilograms of titanium chloride. And we've got 782 kilograms of sodium. And we know that makes 1,989 kilograms of sodium chloride. And we want to find out what mass of titanium is produced. Now, to answer this question, you need to understand that in a chemical reaction, there is a conservation of mass. OK, the mass of the reactants must equal the mass of the products. OK. So we can say that 1,615 plus 782 equals whatever the mass of titanium is plus 1,989. So we can work out using our calculator that 1,615 plus 782 gives you 2,397. And that still equals the unknown mass of titanium plus 1,989. Okay, so to find the unknown mass of titanium, rearrange the equation. So we're going to do 2,397 
minus 1989 and that gives you 408 as your mass of titanium okay that's your final answer for one mark table three shows the solubility of sodium chloride in 100 centimeters cubed of aqueous solution at different temperatures so let's look at table three so on the left hand side we've got the solubility of sodium chloride in grams per 100 centimeter cubed and on the right hand side we've got the temperature in degrees celsius so let's just think about actually what is solubility well when we're talking about solubility we're talking about some things ability to dissolve okay so we're talking about how much of the sodium chloride dissolves in grams per 100 centimeter cubed okay so this question asks us on figure 13 we need to plot the data shown on the grid okay the grid in table three which i've just included here and then draw a line of best fit so i've done this on figure 13 already so let's talk through this so the first thing to note is that each of these small squares on the y-axis represents 0.05, okay? So on the y-axis, we've got the solubility of sodium chloride in grams per 100 centimeter cubed, which is these left-hand side values on table three. And then on the x-axis, we've got the temperature in degrees Celsius, okay? Which is the data on the right-hand side. So, the first thing I did was I plotted the points. And you can see I've used X's to plot my points. And I've tried to keep them as accurate as possible. Remembering that each small square is 0 0.05. Now, what I found when I plotted my points was that this result here at 40 degrees Celsius, which was 37.37 for solubility, I found that that didn't really fit this trend. So I've identified that result as an anomaly. It's an anomalous result because it doesn't fit the trend. Then what I've done is I've drawn a line of best fit. And I've done it as best as I can because I am doing this digitally. So hopefully you might be able to get a slightly less wonky line when you do it on paper. But hopefully you can see the general idea is that the line of best fit is a smooth curve, okay, that goes through as many of the points as possible, obviously excluding this anomaly. So this question was worth three marks, okay, and two marks were awarded for plotting the points correctly, okay, and the final mark was awarded for a line of best fit. Okay. The product sodium chloride is dissolved in water to separate it from the titanium. At 30 degrees Celsius, the solubility of sodium chloride is 36 kilograms per 100 decimeter cubed we need to calculate the minimum volume of water in decimeters cubed at 30 degrees Celsius needed to dissolve 1,989 kilograms of sodium chloride. So I'm just going to write down some information that we've got. So at 30 degrees, we know that the solubility is 36 kilograms per 100 decimeter cubed. Now, we want to know the minimum volume of water in decimeters cubed, again, at 30 degrees Celsius, this time for 1,989 kilograms. And that's per something decimeters cubed, which is what we want to work out. So the way I would approach this question 
is to think, well, how do I get from 36 to 1989? And to work that out, I could do 1989 divided by 36, okay, which gets you 55.25. So I know that to get from 36 to 1989, I need to times by 55.25. Therefore, if I've times the mass by 55.25, I need to times the volume by 55.25. Okay, so to work out this volume at 1989, I need to do 100 times 55.25, okay, which gets you 5,525 decimeters cubed. So there was two marks awarded for this question. One mark was for showing working out, a correct method of working out, and the second mark was for your final answer. Now, the way that the mark scheme suggested to do it was to do 1,989 multiplied by 100 and then divided by 36. And again, you get the same answer. OK, so there's two different methods of working it out both of which would get you two marks. This question asks us to calculate the percentage by mass of titanium in titanium chloride, which is TiCl4. We need to give our answer to three significant figures, and we've been given the relative atomic masses of chlorine, to be 35.5 and titanium to be 48. So basically we need to work out what proportion of the mass of TiCl4 is Ti. And to do that we need to use the relative atomic mass of titanium and we need to work out what proportion of that is it in comparison to the relative molecular mass of TiCl4, the whole compound? And because it's a percentage that we want, we're going to want to times our answer by 100. OK, so let's substitute in some numbers. So the relative atomic mass of titanium is 48. Now, the relative molecular mass of TiCl4 will be the atomic mass of titanium, which is 48, plus four times the atomic mass of chlorine, which is 35.5, because it's TiCl4, right? There's four chlorine atoms. Again, that's times 100. So let's simplify what's on the bottom there. So you've got 48 divided by 190. Okay, so 190 is the MR of TiCl4. And still times 100, remember, because we want it as a percentage. So if you type that in your calculator, you will get a very long number, which looks something like 25.2631, etc., etc. Now, going back to the question, remember, it wants us to give our answer to three significant figures. OK, so if we round that to three significant figures, you get 25.3%. So it was a three mark question. The first mark was awarded for working out the MR the relative molecular mass of TiCl4 as 190. The second mark comes from having an unrounded answer, like that. And the third mark is a mark for rounding. OK, so rounding your answer to three significant figures. The next question says, to suggest, 
OK, so, so suggest is our command word here. And remember, a suggest command word means that this question is on something that maybe you haven't specifically been taught at school, but it requires you to connect together lots of different bits of chemistry. OK, so we need to suggest why the reaction is done in an atmosphere of dry argon instead of air, which contains water vapour. So let's think about what we know. So what do we know about argon? Well, if you use your periodic table, you should be able to work out that argon is in group 8 or group 0, depending on what you want to call it. So it's a noble gas. And remember that noble gases are very unreactive. Okay, They are inert. And this is because they have a full outer shell of electrons. So they don't want to lose electrons, nor do they want to gain electrons. They're very electronically stable. Okay. So now let's think about air. Now, air, remember, is a mixture. Okay, It's a mixture of lots of different gases. Things like nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, methane, water vapour. OK, there's lots of gases that make up air. So what I've just shown in the purple is the reaction that we were given at the start of this question. So titanium chloride plus sodium makes titanium plus sodium chloride. So let's answer this question. So the first point to make in this question is to say that argon is unreactive. OK, and we've explained why that's because it's in group eight. The second point to make is to talk about the water vapour, which they've specifically mentioned in the question. So we need to say that the water vapour would react with the reactants. So it could react with the titanium chloride or you could have put that it could react with the sodium. OK, now the final point to make, remember, this is a three mark question. Is to say, well, the air contains oxygen, doesn't it? As we've just discussed, air is a mixture. And essentially that oxygen could react with could react with the reactants or you could have wrote that it could react with the products okay that's that, that that's an alternate answer so your marks for this question one mark for saying that argon is unreactive one mark for talking about the water vapor could react and you could have said that it could react with the titanium chloride or the sodium. And then the final mark is for talking about oxygen and saying that it could react with the reactants. Or you could have said that it could react with the products. The final question says to explain why titanium conducts electricity. So our command word here is explain. OK, so we need to dig deep into the chemistry that we've learned to explain this property. So the property being um, electrical conductivity. So let's think about what we know about titanium. Well, titanium is a metal. OK, so titanium has a metallic structure, which you can see in this diagram. OK, so the metallic structure is a lattice of positive ions. OK, so these positive metal ions are arranged in rows, in layers. And surrounding these positive metal ions are delocalized electrons. OK, and it's these delocalized electrons which explain why metals such as titanium can conduct electricity. So, the first point to make is that titanium has delocalized electrons 
And why is that? So these electrons are from the outer shells. Okay, they've been lost from the outer shells. So then we can talk about the motion of the delocalized electrons. So the delocalized electrons are free to move. And remember, they're carrying charge. And they can move around the whole structure. OK, now, if you think from physics, if you've covered electricity in physics, you'll have learned that a current. OK, current is moving charge. So essentially, current is just a flow of electrons. So if you've got electrons moving, you've got a current, haven't you? Because you've got charged particles moving. So the marks for this question. First mark is from talking about the delocalized electrons. OK, so from the outer shell. So there's your first mark. Your second mark, then, is from talking about the delocalized electrons being free to move. OK, carrying charge would be an extra point that you could include. And the fact that they can move throughout the whole structure is perfect for your final mark.